Welcome to the Council of Trend Podcast, a production of Catholic Answers. When I did drama in high school and early college, the most fun I had was playing the villain. Uh, I mean, being the hero is great, obviously. The protagonist, you get the biggest applause at the end of the show. But being the antagonist, the villain, you get to stretch as an actor. And you get to actually kind of have fun, chew the scenery. And so I got to be the villain a few times in different productions, or at least one of the antagonists. And that was just fun. You do the curtain call, people kind of boo you. But they know that you can't have a great protagonist without a compelling antagonist, right? So that's what I want to talk about today here on Free For All Friday. I want to talk about my favorite villains of all time. So Monday, Wednesday, we talk apologetics and theology. But on Friday, we talk about whatever I want to talk about. So today we're going to talk about uh, movies. Now, there are great villains in literature, and maybe we'll save that for um, another Free For All Friday. But today... I want to talk about some of my favorite villains from movies. Now, if I don't mention somebody on here, it doesn't mean that they're a bad villain. As in, of course, every villain is bad morally. Um, I guess depending on the story you watch, right? Because you could watch a story where things are backwards, where you have an evil protagonist and a good antagonist. Most people don't want to watch a story like that, though. Uh, but the So the villains here, if I don't mention a villain, it doesn't mean there is something inadequate about them. There's so many great villains out there. These are the ones that just popped into my mind, and I'm going to jump into them right now. But there's nothing in... I'm not ranking them, by the way, in particularity. These are just some that pop out at me. Most you have heard of, if there's some of my favorite villains, they're iconic villains. Uh, but the first one I'm going to start off here might not jump into people's minds right away, but he is easily one of my favorite villains, and that is... Uh, Alonzo Harris from the film Training Day. So Training Day came out several years ago. Uh, I think it was directed by Antoine Fuqua. And it's about a a cop, Denzel Washington, who's training a a new detective, uh, Ethan Hawke, uh, to be a narcotics detective. And it's also, by the way, it's one of these old, not older, it's like probably more than 10 years old at this point. It's one of those films that takes place over the course of 24 hours. I love crazy day films. I love films where it's, hey, 24 hours, Here's what happens, and it almost feels kind of claustrophobic and tense with the pacing as you go through it. So it starts off, it seems normal, like Denzel Washington is the good guy, and he's training Ethan Hawke to be a narcotics detective. But as, as the film progresses, you eventually come to learn that Denzel Washington's character, Alonzo Harris, is actually a bad guy, that he's a, a dirty cop. And so he's doing things that are illegal. And so it slowly dawns on you as the movie progresses that he's using uh, Ethan Hawke uh, I think his name is Jake in the in the film, to his own advantages. So there's a scene where Harris has done something illegal. I'm not going to try to spoil everything, but he's done something illegal, and he tries to rationalize it to Ethan Hawke's character, to Jake, saying, no, this is what we have to do. We have to do these illegal things to catch the real bad guys. And to me, the great villains, the best villains, the most uh, provoke- provocative ones, they are the ones that you can kind of see things from their point of view. That's what's so sinister about it. So I'll play a, I'll play a clip for of it here. They're talking to each other. It starts with Ethan Hawke's character, Jake, saying, I don't want to be a detective. This is what's involved. I'll, I'll go back to writing parking tickets in the valley. Oh. <laughs> it can't be like this. It is this way, man. I'm sorry I exposed you to it, but it is. It's ugly. But it's necessary. I became a cop to put away drug dealers, the poisoners, the criminals, not to be one. You sound just like me. And I know what you're going through. I know what you're feeling. You're scared. I'm not scared. Yes, you are. You're terrified. Everybody goes through that the first time I went through it. The sooner you can match what's in your head with what's going on in the real world, the better you're going to feel in this business. You've got to have a little dirt on you for anybody to trust you. And when all this is behind you, there's going to be a whole other world that opens up for you. I walk a higher path, son. I can give you the keys to all the doors. What are you talking about? My guys are pretty good, but they're not leaders. They're clowns. You're a leader. You want my job? You got it. You want to lock up poisonous? This is the best place to do it. And so it's amazing that you know, he's appealing to him like, yeah, I know I do bad things, but it's in the service of a good cause. I walk a higher path, son. Uh, 
and just watch the whole film. Now, I would, if I had to rate it with the old USCCB rating system, it would be morally offensive. There's uh, violence, uh, sexuality, nudity. Uh, so it's if you're sensitive to those things, you probably shouldn't watch it. But I still think overall, it is a very excellent film. I don't mind films that portray evil, as long as they portray evil getting its just desserts. And that does take place here in Training Day. So I, I do uh, like it for that reason. Uh, the next one would be uh, Hans Landa from the uh, 2009 uh, Quarantino, uh, Quentin Tarantino film, uh, Inglorious Bees. Uh, you know, I'm not going to say the whole title on here. I want to keep things somewhat appropriate. Uh, that, you know, that would be uh, another example. Uh, but he's a Nazi officer. And whenever he is in a scene, especially the scene where he's interrogating people who are hiding Jews, the, the sinister quality that he brings to the scenes of, of dread, of this authoritarian who wants to be polite, but you can tell the gears are turning in his head, uh, it, it is um, definitely chilling. So I'm going to add Hans Landa on top of that. I got another Hans coming up. You could probably already guess if you know movies what Hans I'm going to talk about. So that would be a number number two I wanted to to throw in there, uh, but another one I want to talk about is uh, the T one thousand from Terminator Two. So Terminator Two Judgment Day came out in the early nineties. I want to say nineteen ninety two, and the original Terminator was a horror film it's about a robot assassin coming after a woman who's going to give birth to the leader of humanity against the machines in the future. So a robot sent back in time to kill Sarah Connor, Arnold Schwarzenegger doesn't talk very much he's very menacing it's basically a horror film and in so and arnold's very imposing in that regard in the first terminator terminator 2 is more of an action film uh still has some horror elements to it but it's more of an action film where another version of arnold is sent back in time to uh save sarah connor's son john john connor and another terminator from so he's sent by the resistance humans the arnold schwarzenegger terminator reprogrammed to save john connor's life so the robots send an upgraded Terminator. Uh, this one's made of liquid metal, the T-1000. Well, I say it's, by, it's played by Robert Patrick, is what I want to say. Did I get the name right? Google says Robert Patrick. You better believe it. He's made of liquid metal. And when he walks around, he has this steely, icy glaze. There's a scene where he's chasing after John Connor on the motorcycle, and he's running very fast, but in a kind of unreal robotic way how he runs but the way he looks and scans the surroundings he portrays menace but an inhuman menace that he's not a human he looks human when he's his liquid metal he can take on any form so he can impersonate people and so there are scenes where there's one scene where he impersonates somebody he's found out by the other terminator and you can see that he's ruthlessly killed someone off camera and then it's revealed and he's just cold, calculating that steely gaze. Uh, it's uh, the only time he ever looks shocked in the entire film is uh, when he gets his comeuppance uh, at the at the end. So won't spoil it for you, but it's been out for thirty years. So you know it, that's that's kind of on you at that point. Uh, so we've got so far, you know, there's different kinds, right? We got uh, Alonzo Harris is the smooth talking uh, bad guy. Uh, you know, the T1, you know, Hans Landa would be like the polite authoritarian. T1000 is the inhuman, cold, and steely uh, villain. But they're all very cool, cold, and calculated. And this next villain is calculated as well, but he also has a chaotic element that makes him frightening. And that, of course, would be the Joker. The Joker, in general, is just one of the greatest antagonists of all time. And one of the best portrayals of the Joker would definitely be Heath Ledger's portrayal in The Dark Knight. Um, that when you watch those scenes, like he just, he's all in there. The makeup they do for the Joker is just fantastic. Like when I look, I don't see Heath Ledger. I see the Joker and his little ticks, his licking of the lips. It's frenetic. So there's evil here, but what makes it so evil is that it's chaotic, unpredictable evil. And so it's different than Batman. You know, Batman is logical, ordered, has a plan for everything. The Joker has a plan, too, but it's almost kind of like a chaotic plan. And so there's a famous scene where he, uh, you know, takes advantage of Harvey Dent in the film, played by Aaron Eckhart, I want to say. I think it's Aaron Eckhart. And uh, turns him into the villain Two-Face. And he talks to him in the hospital before he blows the hospital up. And explaining to him about the plan and the way his voice, his mannerisms, it's an excellent embodiment of what you would call chaotic evil. So here, let me play a clip. 
Look what I did to this city with a few drums of gas and a couple of bullets. Hmm? You, you know what I noticed? Nobody panics when things go according to plan. Even if the plan is horrifying. If tomorrow I tell the press that like a gangbanger will get shot, or a truckload of soldiers will be blowing up, nobody panics. Because it's all part of the plan. But when I say that one little old mare will die, well then everyone loses their minds! I love how you know, he almost like explodes. Everyone loses their minds. Ah. <laughs> but he doesn't do it in a cheesy way. He doesn't trade into Cesar Romero's Joker from like the from like the 60s. Uh, but watch a Dark Knight, uh, one of the I wouldn't even really call it a superhero film per se. Dark Knight is really more of a, a noir thriller. It's almost like a noir crime thriller. And that's what I think makes it so makes it so good uh, for among films in general, but even among what you would call superhero films. Next one is a tie. So, so far, I've talked about uh, human villains. Some of my favorite villains, uh, the ones that I kind of stick with me, are not human, actually. These two are a tie. The first one is the shark from Jaws, and the second are the, veloc- and the velociraptors from Jurassic Park. Those, I mean, those ones have totally stuck with me as a kid, right? So, Jaws, what was funny, the shark from Jaws would not have been a good villain, uh, if they went with the original plan. The original plan was for the robot to work really well, and you would have seen the shark all over the movie. And there was a malfunction. They couldn't do that. So they had to film a lot of it, hiding the shark underwater. The opening scene of Jaws is terrifying. There's a woman swimming, and then she's being attacked, but you don't see the, the shark, and it pulls underwater a little bit, and she's she's you know shaking and shivering and screaming, and then she's gone. And it's it's scary. Makes you not want to go into the water, you know? So the shark from Jaws is scary because of how it's hidden and then finally revealed. Uh, the raptor, but so it's always very menacing in that regard as it hunts people throughout the film. Uh, the, and it's still scary in the brief clips, like when it shows up on the boat and it almost bites, I think it's Brody. Maybe it was Brody. I think it was the other guy, Richard Dry, eh, whatever. Uh, almost bites one of the guy's arms off and then he goes off screen. Scary stuff. It's just brief glimpses. The raptors from Jurassic Park are not hidden. Well, they're hidden at the beginning of the film. You, you see they're in the containment uh, uh, crate where they kill off the guy at the beginning of the movie, and then they're in the, um, the raptor pen, and they eat the bull, but they don't show the raptors. They show them feeding a bull being lowered by a crane into the raptor pit, and then the ra- you hear the shrieks of the raptors, and the bull gets demolished, and you just see like a torn harness being pulled up by the crane. That is Spielberg at his best. You know, we've got these monsters here, but you don't um, you don't see them you don't see them coming. Uh, they still exist as a nightmare in your imagination until later in the movie when they're released, and then they're able to stalk people throughout the um, the compounds. People might say to me, "Why isn't the T Rex the best villain?" The T Rex, I almost see, see think of him as a deuteragonist. The Jurassic Park series, he kind of becomes another hero. Uh, he's later used in Jurassic World to fight uh, that evil cloned dinosaur gigant it wasn't gigantosaurus i forget because jurassic world wasn't a super good movie but um the raptors uh, i I think just what makes them interesting is that they're hidden in the beginning of the film but then later on there's the scene in the cafeteria the mess hall the kitchen where they're stalking the kids and you see and and the rope the animatronics and CGI are flawless together, that you see them hunting, seeing them hunting these kids in this industrial kitchen as they're snooping around, and one of them taps the claw. They have a a retractable claw on their foot that they use to slice you apart, and he taps his claw as he's walking through, and they snort, and they look at things, and they look like, they act like birds, because dinosaurs evolved from birds, as they're they're creeping around. Uh, I think that makes them really, they're, they're some of the best... You know, you villain. So you know, say so it's not a villain; it's a monster. There's a difference. Uh, you know, whatever. You know, what's funny? I didn't include in this list. Actually, maybe I should have. I, horror villains are, are not the ones that really are as intriguing to me because they're just, you know, they're out to kill people. This is just, just kind of simple. So I, I don't have Michael Myers on here. I don't have Freddy Krueger. Uh, I don't have uh, Pinhead. Uh, you know, I, I, Candyman. I don't know. They're just not as interesting to me. These villains I find to be more interesting. Um, to look at usually from uh action films or thrillers uh, you get really good villains all right let me give you the last three that i have here on my list next one is hans gruber that'd be the bad guy from die hard it was at 1989 with bruce willis alan rickman 
uh, playing a Eastern German uh, terrorist, takes over Nakatomi Plaza. It's actually based on a book. Imagine, like, you get to, you know, you think, like, Die Hard, like, read it as a book. And the book is, is interesting it, uh, to see how they adapted it. Uh, but I, I think, you know, he's easily the best of all the Die Hard antagonists, by far. Uh, that he comes off as smooth, sophisticated, charming, uh, but then also violent and scary when he needs to be. But he almost he's almost kind of affable in a sense. Uh, and he just Alan Rickman just has a wonderful way of talking. I just love I just love how he talks. He, he, so Br- the movie Bruce Willis is in the building. The terrorists have taken over. He's fighting the terrorists one by one in the skyscraper, trying to free the hostages, which also includes his wife. He kills. Why well, remember he kills one of the terrorists? And straps him to a chair, sends him down in the elevator with a note, and Gruber reads it. Now I have a machine gun. Ho, ho, ho. So here, I'll play a clip where he's uh, on the radio talking to Bruce Willis, uh, John, his character John McClane. He, and he doesn't know exactly who this guy is. Is he a security guard? Is he a cop? And he is a cop. He doesn't know that. He thinks he's like a security guard from the building who's still loose. And he's talking with him, trying to figure out who he is. And while he's ordering his henchmen to go and find Willis or John McClane, it's somewhere in the building. So I love their interaction here. Check on all the others. Don't use the radio. See if he's lying about Marco and find out if anyone else is missing. Mr. Mystery Guest. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Unless you want to open a front door for me. Uh, no, I'm afraid not. But you have me at a loss. You know my name, but who are you? Just another American who saw too many movies as a child. Another orphan of a bankrupt culture who thinks he's John Wayne, Rambo, Marshall Dillon. I was always kind of partial to Roy Rogers, actually. I really like those sequined shirts. Do you really think you have a chance against us, Mr. Cowboy? And then he says, yippee Kaye," and I'm not going to finish it because this is a G-rated podcast. But I love it. You think you really have a chance against us, Mr. Cowboy? Like the European disdain in his voice for the boisterous American. That's what I love. That's what I love. And then when uh, later on in the film, he tries to pretend to be an American and he puts on, I got an American accent. And it, it, you can, I mean, it sounds American, but also sounds like someone pretending to be American. And so it's just great uh, the way he reacts and, and interacts with people. Last two, Hannibal Lecter. Oh, I had his kidney with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. <laughs> Uh, Hannibal Lecter, played by Anthony Hopkins in The Silence of the Lambs, working with Jodie Foster to catch Buffalo Bill, the serial killer, uh, who I think is supposed to be like transgender, but would not be portrayed like this today. Actually, you know what I could do? I should do this for you guys. Movies that could not be made anymore, right? What are the movies that could not be made anymore? You could not make Silence of the Lambs today. And I was uh, thinking about this the other night. You couldn't make Mrs. Doubtfire today. Because it makes fun of the idea of being transgender or Ace Ventura. Man, I, got, I, I shouldn't spoil. I could do a whole, I'm going to do a whole episode on all the movies that you could not make today uh, just because of how our culture has gone cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. But I love Hannibal Lecter. When we did a skit once for our Life Teen group, I had a villain in that skit. For, it was for the, college, the high school youth group I volunteered for. And I was a villain in it, and I based my character on Hannibal Lecter. Hello, Clarice. And once again, like Alan Rickman, I think I like these characters just for me because they're very sophisticated, they're very intelligent, and so they're not just like brute monsters. What makes them scary is um, just be, is how intelligent and the plans that they have. Oh, you know what I got to add to the list? I got to add him here. Thanos. It's kind of hard. You got to have the whole MCU arc, and Thanos really grows in the arc in the MCU, but he really does, played by Josh Brolin. By the time you get to Endgame, he, I mean, well, in, sorry, more like in Infinity War, he's threatening, but he becomes a very threatening and even sympathetic villain in that regard. He is easily the best villain right up there with Michael B. Jordan uh, in Black Panther. Uh, so those two are probably the best villains in the MCU. Uh, you might, I might even want to give it to Michael B. Jordan because just in one film, he does a great job as a villain. But Thanos was the perfect antagonist. Uh, he is someone that portrays a realistic threat to a group as powerful as the Avengers. Uh, But he's not a mindless threat. 
like his motivation kind of makes sense in a twisted way, trying to find balance to the universe. You know, he's not just a bland video game character trying to to rule the world. Oh, that's another great villain. Raul Julia in Street Fighter the movie, just because he plays it so over the top and cheesy. I love it. One of those examples of so bad it's good. Raul Julia playing M. Bison in the Street Fighter movie. So uh, that's another one that I will put in there. He, he says lines like, of course! <laughs> He's just it's so over the top. But um, uh, Thanos, Hannibal Lecter, Hans Gruber, you've got these, they're highly intelligent, one step ahead of the villain, uh, and almost, I love sometimes that Thanos would, um, see, like, he smirks before he kills Loki. You should have chosen your words more carefully, as Guardian. Uh, and Hannibal Lecter, uh, at the end of uh, Silence of the Lambs, when he's, because he's a cannibal and he's going to take revenge on somebody, he says, I have to go, Clarice. I'm having an old friend for dinner. It's just that kind of stuff that almost like a villain that has a sense of humor makes them one of my one of my favorite villains in that regard. And the last one, the last one, might be one might be maybe it's my favorite villain of all time. It's one that's pretty high up there, I would say. Who do you think it is? The answer? Darth Vader. I mean you've got here, it's not really you don't have... It's funny, because you're like, he's not like Alan Rickman, or, you know, he's not like Hannibal Lecter. Trent, why do you like him? You're right, he's not like a smooth-talking bad guy, but he just seems like the embodiment of evil. He's all dressed in black. He has that awesome helmet. Uh, he's got amazing powers. He can choke people just with raising his hand. He has a laser sword. Uh, he's, you know, he's a Sith. He's He represents the dark side. And he will be ruthless with people. He instills fear and, and commands respect where he is. And he's someone that the protagonist would legitimately fear. Uh, way better than the guy that they had in the newer films. What was that guy? Kylo Ren. Ugh. That's emo Darth Vader. No, I want the real Darth Vader. What makes it work is that it's really Darth Vader is really two actors. David Prowse was the actor who wore the suit and did the physicality for the role. And they recorded him, and they replaced his voice with James Earl Jones. Okay? So you probably remember what Darth Vader sounds like, but I'm going to start with uh, David Prowse. Okay? So here is the original. This is the scene where Darth Vader boards, I think it's the Slave 4, the rebel ship that's fleeing. And he's trying to find the plans of the Death Star. This is not James Earl Jones. This is the original voice of David Prowse, the actor who was in the Darth Vader suit. They eventually replaced it, and you will see why. Where is the data you intercepted? What have you done with those information tapes? We intercepted no information. So he's holding up a guy, by the way, and he's choking him. So that's the other, the rebel, and then the other guy is David Prowse. This is a consular ship. Didn't you see the markings? Where are Diplomatic mission. Where are those tanks? Uh, only the commander knows that. This ship carries the crest of Alderaan. Was there any of the royal family on board? Who were you carrying? <sighs> okay, so it's not imposing at all. Where are those plans? What have you done? It's just like, oh, he doesn't say, and he's talking through the mask, right? So he's doing the best that he can right? Like trying to get the audio from him. But that was the original voice. And George Lucas, the best decision he ever made in Star Wars, hands down, was he dubbed over David Prowse's voice with James Earl Jones. Uh, so this is CNN. So now I'll play the same scene again with uh, Jones's voice dubbed over. Death Star plans are not in the main computer. Where are those transmissions you intercepted? What have you done with those plans? We intercepted those transmissions. Uh this is a consular ship. We're on a diplomatic mission. If this is a consular ship, where is the ambassador? <laughs> oh, hey, wait. Oh, and then the clip here actually s swaps them again. So so then I love what he, he says here. So then here's Prowse again. I'm tearing this ship apart piece by piece until you find those tapes. Find the passengers of this vessel. I want them alive. Find the passengers. I want them alive. Now here's James Earl Jones. Commander, tear this ship apart until you found those plans and bring me the passengers. I want them alive. 
like, I mean, there's gravitas, there's threat, there's imminence, there's power. Uh, but it works. You have to think of da- Darth Vader as two actors. David Prowse physically nailed it, and James Earl Jones got the voice right on, right on par. So it's great. Well, thank you guys so much. I hope that was helpful for all of you. And uh, well, I just hope you enjoyed it. Had a lot of fun. If you are a subscriber at TrendhornPodcast.com, leave a comment there. Who are some of your favorite villains that maybe I did not actually include on the list? Maybe we'll revisit them for a part two Greatest Villains episode. But thank you guys, and I hope that you have a very blessed day. If you like today's episode, become a premium subscriber at our Patreon page and get access to member-only content. For more information, visit TrendhornPodcast.com.